Okay, so where do we go next? We went to functional languages. We like the interpretive of V. I found the interpretive aspect interesting. Hopefully you did too. And uh, um, so th there were a lot of things that were different and hopefully interesting. And, uh, you know, there was a problem that, that we fixed for those of you who, uh, whose mind wanders like mine does and you don't want static type checking. You want static type checking. Type checking. And where can we go next? So let's go back to this picture. I said, and by the way, I, I ascribe this to Knut. Actually, this, this was, you know, algorithms, uh, programs is equal to algorithms plus rules was actually invented by a guy called Niklas Wirth. And he invented a language called Pascal. Uh, so, um, and I extended that to saying it's data structures plus algorithms or rules, okay? To contrast that with data mining. So let's figure out rule versus algorithm. Um, can you guys intuitively, based on your knowledge of English or maybe knowledge of computer science, but ideally knowledge of English, tell me the difference between a rules, set of rules and an algorithm? Yeah. Beautiful. What versus how? Okay. What do you want is, is defined by rules. How to get it is defined by algorithms. We talk about performance of algorithms and we talk about correctness of rules. Okay? So, what versus how and, and uh, if I say declarative versus procedural code, does that kind of make sense to you? Where declarative is the what and procedural is the how? Have you guys used it? Have you heard the word declaration before? Right? So what's the dif difference between a declaration and a non-declaration? In C, what's an example of a declaration and what's an example of a non-declaration? <coughs> or in Java? Or any language you know? That, just give me an example for now. So you're saying if you just use the uh, magic number, you're not declaring anything, you're using it. It's appearing in some, some fragment of the program that, that we would call a non-declaration. And if you're declaring a named constant and you're saying named constant equals this, then that's declaration, exactly. So non-declaration uh, uh, is, uh, what about types? When you define a type, type enum or type uh, in, in or, or, or is that a declaration or is that is that a non-declaration? Declaration? So non-declaration you would call it would be in a, that magic number would be used in what kind of construct? What is the outermost uh, what what is the construct to be used in? It, it will be used in a procedure or a function. So that's kind of procedural code telling you what to do, how to do, you know, the step statements. Okay. So uh, let's make this more clear. If I just say floats, I know I'm using a little more complicated example than what Nick gave. I'm just saying floats equals 4.8F, 5.2F, 4.5F. That's an example of a declaration or non-declaration? Declaration. I'm just saying what I want. Okay. The, the system could go and lay out these three numbers in this way with no spaces in between or with spaces in between. You can't do a thing about that. You hope it does it the left way because it's more efficient. But you had no control about what it did with the declaration. Okay. Whereas this particular sum that I've defined is procedural. I have defined it using, using iteratively using a loop. But I could have defined it recursively. Okay, so there I have some choice. I have control. So this is this is example of procedural code, or algorithmic code, and and so we see that this whole, you know, even in an ordinary language, you have some parts that are declarative, and some parts that are procedural, some parts that are the what, and some parts that are the how. 
And what we try to do when we go to declarative languages is to push everything to the what and have no how. That's a declaration, but the loop. The declaration is, can the declaration use a procedure? What if I want to say that floats equals some blank? Is that a declaration or is that a procedure? So in, 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 uh, um, in, in uh, languages that came after Pascal, you can have pieces of code that are both declaration and statements. Okay. So when I went and said float retval equals float uh, uh, ret, uh, of 0, 0.0, 0, uh, 0, 0.0 is a double, so I've converted that into a float. Okay, I didn't do 0, 0.0f. I'm saying at this point, execute this, you know, th there's a sequential execution. And I'm initializing the variable too. So I'm kind of doing both. So that's why you're confused because some things can be both. In fact, we will see even in, in, in declarative languages that we have a little bit of procedural aspect to it. But the for loop, okay, now you can say the int i is being declared, but, but it's, it's, it's really a piece of code. So I would say when, when order matters, it is code, which might also be just declaring, declaring something, okay? And the thing, the, thing, the, the reason why I consider the, the first one to be more declarative than the rest, the, because there are more decisions to be made in the first one. You can choose to go and allocate it this way or that way. There are fewer choices in that other, 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 in your float thing and the magic number thing because you're just assigning that value. Well, how many different ways can you assign? Okay, you can load it into three different registers and then assign it or you just load it, the registers straight away assign it or not, you know, so you just don't have any choices. There. So when you have choices which are made by somebody else, then you're focusing on the what and, and when the choice is exercised by you, you're doing the how. But there is, in almost everything, you know, between functional and non-functional languages, there's a fine line, if you allow assignment, there's a fine line between everything. So, for example, with the ref valve, it's based on something else picking up values to implement it, but it can also declaratively just say ref valve equals this, 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 equals this number. So the reason it's procedure is because it's based on So, if, if you say return, you're saying execute this piece of code at this time. Mm -hmm. it, you, can, you can define a smaller piece of code, but you're still, it's still procedural code. Functional code is procedural code. We saw the cond. In cond, we have to evaluate the first pair first, then the second pair, then the third pair. We don't just go and say evaluate it in any order. Okay? So, when an order is given, that's procedural. When you just say what I want, so when they're step by step, it's, 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 it's procedural, otherwise it is. Okay. So I want to talk about purely procedural languages and purely declarative languages. And have you guys seen from your previous classes? And the answer is yes. So the question is where have you seen declarative and um, so here they're complementing. You know, some parts are declarative, some parts are procedure. I want to talk about um, competing. And where have you seen competing declarative and procedure? I'm going to look at you. And we'll see later why. Based on questions you asked in the first time, first class. There was one question I have not satisfactorily answered of yours so far. But anybody else? The question is, have you seen in a previous course required for this class competing declarative and procedure? Yes. You're going down to MIPS, it's all sort of, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. 
So, you know, I actually come from double E. And you're right, I, you know, my undergrad project was microprogramming these myths like architecture using even lower level abstractions. So, at, you know, this how versus what is layering issue also. You know, that the lower layer does the how for, uh, for the what defining the upper layer. So, I'm just talking about go, go, go higher layer, you know, that's, that's too low level. That's, that's fine for a double E major like me, but, you know, people come from mathematics too. Yeah. Sorry? C? C is like that, you know, you have some type declaration, some uh, uh, procedure code, so it's both. So, what are the prerequisites of this course? Yes. So, in Java, you declare the array, but you also have procedural code, right? I want a language that's purely procedural and purely declarative. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And what will the procedural context, uh, procedural equivalent of it? Turing machine or something weaker than that? So he says, you know, a context-free grammar is declarative. And a parser would be procedural. But what sort of the, but parser could be written in a Turing machine, right? So this is why I'm looking at him because he talked of recursive, the uh, recursive sets versus recursive enumerable sets, right? See, I remember more than you do about your questions. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so procedure may be imperative functional. So pure declarative system replacing pure procedural system. Does this picture sound familiar for 455? Should be in your blood drive. Okay. To me, that's the most fundamental computer science course. And uh, the undergrad committee right now tried to remove it as a required course. But fortunately, uh, Jim Anderson fought, for, fought against it and for, uh, so did I. So it's going to be a required course still, whether you like it or not. So what's, what, what's declarative here and what's uh, procedural? So finite state automata, you say, if you're in this state, you see a one, do this. You see a zero, go to this state. Next state, if you see a one, you do this. You see a zero, do this. It's all do, 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 do. It's all procedural. The upper one says, a regular expression is this. I don't care how you do it. I hope I got it right. And just go process it. Okay? So that's the what. And the below is the how. Okay? So... Declarative procedure. There was a hand up. Okay. Make sense? Okay. And, and I, I don't know what you guys did in 455, but I assume you did. You were given regular expressions and you were told to create finite state automata for them and maybe even vice versa. Okay. So the set of languages, set of things you can compute are equivalent. Some people are nodding. I wish more of you guys were nodding. Okay. But basically, you, 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 know, you got the idea. And by the way, which do you prefer? Rather write, would you rather write code to go and scan text or would you rather regular expression? Not sure? Regular expression? Do you, do you do so without Googling or without using a regular expression evaluator? I can never get them right. I got them right for my exams during during 455, but boy, a little mistake here, a little, you know, and, and I, I sometimes just want to run a Java program because I don't know what's going on. I can't step through and debug it, okay? That's the problem you'll have when you go and, start, when you go and use Prolog. Okay, I'm just warning you. So uh, you better get it right because you can't step through and figure out what's right. And that's why I made that an extra credit assignment, okay? So other examples. Finite state automata, regular expressions, regular languages. It's, it's, they're both equivalent. They both accept regular languages. And pushed on automata is what you would, what you didn't remember. And that does context-free grammars, which is declarative. And 
they're both equivalent because they accept context-free languages. Okay. So next comes Turing machine or did you guys study something in between Turing machines and context-free grammars also? I'm just curious. Sir. I don't know what goes on in 455. I just know that material from, you know, when I took it. Is there anything, pow anything more powerful than context-free grammars and less powerful than Turing machines? Think about it. I'm using the word context-free grammar. What is the opposite of free? Bonded. It is without context. He, he mentioned, they mentioned it. Did I or did your 455? Professor. Professor. Okay. So there's linear bonded automata and context sensitive grammars. And uh, that is context sensitive language. Okay. And the next machine that you get is, you know, assuming we have infinite memory, infinite disk, then Java, C, Lisp, ML are all equivalent Turing machines. Okay. And these are recursively enumerable languages. Okay. And we don't have, you have not studied in 455, a declarative equivalent of this. Okay. And that is where logic programming comes in. And that's what we're going to study next. And study means we'll see ne next and then we'll study it in depth later. Okay. And what happened to your recursive languages? So, you know, I studied the stuff both from a automata theory point of view and from a mathematical point of view also. There were two different courses, in fact, I think. And recursive languages come from a pure mathematical basis. And recursive language, in, in, so I mentioned the halting problem a long time ago. The halting problem occurs only with Turing machines. It doesn't occur with all the other machines. In other words, it occurs only with recursively enumerable languages. And this is just for your benefit to answer his question. This is not going to be something I'll, I'm going to test in any exam here. Recursive languages are the languages for which the halting problem does not exist. They are a superset of context sensitive languages. Okay. But there is no machine more powerful than an LBA and less powerful than a Turing machine to accept them. Okay. So that's your answer. I don't know if it's satisfactory or not. Uh, and, and if it confuses you, don't worry. No. That's just cheating. <laughs> okay. In all other things, there's a notion of correctness. This is pure guesswork. Okay. Saying, I don't even know what I want. Okay. Let's get something that, you know, and, 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 and see whether I want what I get. So we'll go to that also next. Um, but that's basically, so just a different, and I'm going to call it programming by example. Okay. But the correctness is all, you know, if you're trying to be general, the correctness is gone. If you, if you build a very specialized machine, then the examples are just input. That's just another language. But when you go, when you go to machine language, you know, it's, it's all guesswork, right? I mean, the guesses work more often than not. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not that. It's, an, it's, it's, you know, statistics. Statistics is a deep field. Okay. But from a programming point of view, it's all guesswork. Okay. But good. I'm glad you're linking that up. And how do you understand logic programming? And, it, you know, actually, logic programming, um, we'll go and draw an analogy between logic programming and context figure. And those of you who have done compilers, you, you, you know, you've actually used these things more uh, deeply. Those of you who have done 401 with me, we've done grammars in 401. Um, and you have, of course, done grammars in 455. Okay. So let's go and look at, you know, context-free grammar to draw an analogy with logic programming. Okay. At this point, I'm doing overview. So I'm just doing everything by analogy and, you know, not really defining things very precisely. So when you have a grammar, 
you use a certain vocabulary and 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 uh, you you're using uh, you know you, you have um, you have these entities in the grammar so can i talk about two two kinds of entities in the grammar if you just look at the syntax you see difference between you know you see some arrows you see a, you know you see a left hand side of an arrow you see a right hand side of an arrow and you see um, you see other 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 aspects here so can i can I, uh, can I just formally describe what's happening in terms of some, some smaller, I'm saying this is a grammar. Can we define the grammar in terms of a smaller vocabulary? So what is the first line saying? A little louder. So this is a recursive definition and I'm giving a rule, right? And the left-hand side of the rule says, I'm defining something. And the right-hand side says, here's the, if you think of procedure, that's the function body, that's the, that's, that, that's the function declaration, that's the function body. So I'm defining the left-hand side in terms of the right-hand side. Right? And uh, there is R. Okay, we see the R there. Now, there is ampersand, ampersand, and there is Boolean expression. Do you see a distinction between the two of them, syntactically? I've used two entities things there. I've said Boolean expression is Boolean expression and Boolean expression. And I want to dis distinct, make a distinction between uh, Boolean expression and, and and. What's the fundamental difference between the two? But, but from a grammar point of view, it doesn't know. Grammar just says it's, grammar doesn't know, it doesn't have to be defined for a programming language. So from a grammar point of view, it is a, ah, you're getting to the, you get, you get, getting to the correct vocabulary, but using, the, using it wrongly. So non-terminal is the opposite of a terminal. So which of them is going to be a non-terminal, which is a, them is a terminal. What's the distinction between a terminal and a non-terminal? Because a non-terminal is something that needs a rule. A terminal is something that's just given to you by the scanner. No rules needed there. Okay? We don't go and define what ampersand ampersand is. That the scanner gave you and it said that's it's ampersand ampersand. So the grammar is defining something in terms of something else and is defining non-terminals in terms of terminals so there's a basis that we start with and from the, and the, these things we put in rules so on the left hand side you cannot have a terminal on the right hand side you can have a terminal or a non-terminal make sense i'm seeing some confused looks here this should be bread and butter to you after 455 no okay yeah Non-terminal reason. Terminal is just given to you by the scanner. Okay? So terminals are if, then, else, that the scanner gave you. And we don't define what an if statement is, what a Boolean expression is, in terms of that. Okay? Declaratively. How many of you have done compilers, by the way? So for you guys, this is, no wonder you guys are bored. Okay? They're looking down. Okay. You never know when you see, when I see bored faces, whether they're totally lost or totally bored. Okay. So, uh, okay. Now, given a grammar, what do we do with the grammar? What, what practical question does it answer? I think I've got some more animation here. What, what do I use a grammar for? So there's a query that you can ask, okay, is not word, word would be a scanner, a sentence, sequence of words, which is much tougher, is in some language or not, okay. So the notion of having rules 
the notion of having some things given to you, and the notion of queries translates also to logic programming. Okay? That's, that's the basic thing. And give you a whole prologue program here. So we're going to use prologue as an example. Prologue also was invented very prehistoric days, early 70s. Uh, you know, if you guys think of uh, these times to be rapidly, you know, times where technology is evolving rapidly. But if you're a programming language person, you know, things kind of stopped after 70s. Uh, so all the languages we're looking at, you know, were done, done 70s or earlier. Uh, Java was done later. But uh, I'll talk about that too. Uh, well, maybe I'll say it right now. So uh, when Java got invented, I was at a conference where James Gosling, the inventor of Java, was giving a talk. And uh, my own PhD thesis was implemented in a language called Mesa, which came from Xerox. And Xerox, some Xerox person got up and said, so James, what is it in Java that was not in Mesa? And he kind of struggled with that answer. Okay, so even though Java came much later, it has some interesting points, but it also drew on concepts that came earlier, uh, like Mesa, which came in late 70s, okay, or maybe early 80s, but I believe it's late 70s, okay. So this prologue was done then. And let's, let's just look at this in English and see whether it makes sense. It's, you know, we've seen this problem solved so many different times that hopefully the problem solution gives us an idea of the language. But just look at it for a while. Again, on the top is what I entered in a text editor. And the bottom is what I entered interactively. Okay. And um, just look at it and then we'll try to understand it. So, do you see some queries? What's an example of a query there? Where do you think there's some input and output? It's interesting. This is sort of... A, you know, you, I, you know, something, somebody who's seen Prologue before, it makes total sense to me, but I guess this is not making sense at all, right? <laughs> Sorry? Question is, there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on here. I told you that from context-free grammars, I can take the notion of rules. I can take the notion of things that are given, things that are to be defined in terms of rules, and I can take the notion of a query. I'm starting with the simplest thing, or maybe the most complicated thing. What do you think here looks like a query? Yeah. So, pass 59, comma 79, that's a query. And I get back the answer, no. Okay. So now we are not just saying, is this sentence in the, in, in, in the language? We, are, we have a more sophisticated vocabulary. In fact, the vocabulary is what we defined. Okay, so somehow it must know how to go in answer the query whether 59, 79 together. And 59 is again the total score and, and 79 is the um, final score. And it's giving me the answers. So it's just, you know, like make, making function calls. Okay? So there's an analog to function calls. But those are my queries. And like I said, the bottom window is what I entered interactively. The top window is what I defined earlier. So it makes sense that what I do interactively are queries. And what I do before that is non queries Okay. Now, uh, can you guys point out something that is a rule here? And that must occur in the top window. Yeah, Nathan? Okay, so that's a rule for prologue. That's, that's a rule to define pro the prologue language. I'm saying what is a prologue rule here, which corresponds to a rule in grammars, which defines non-terminal in terms of other non-terminals and, 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 and terminals. So what's a rule? Yeah. What, so what's your name? Matt. Matt. 
Matt? Matt, MSC. MSC, Matt. Okay, oh, easy. You're not, the, you're not a PC. So, okay. So the pass rule, okay? So it's saying you will pass a regular pass total if and that gets a little confusing now, okay? It says find me the value of pass cutoff, okay? So we don't, we don't go and use a value. We say here's a variable called pass cutoff, and uh, find me some, uh, find me, find me something that has been defined as a pass cutoff. Okay, and assign that to the variable pass cutoff. So I'm using the word pass cutoff many way, many times. So the very first thing, so the first thing you agree is not a rule, right? When I just say pass cutoff sixty, there's no rule there. There's no left hand side, right hand side. That's like my scanner. I'm just giving you facts. That 60 is the pass cutoff. Okay? Yeah. So you're defining it all imperative procedurally, right? As functions, and that's fine. That, that's a fine way to understand things. We guys are all implementers, and 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 you know you, you're just looking at the implementation. What I'm really saying is the following: the first thing is a fact. Okay, I'm saying so. It has got just a dot there. I'm I'm not defining a rule. I'm saying sixty is pass cutoff. I could even say. Joe is the father of Henry. Okay? That's just a fact. I'm building a table, if you will, of facts. Okay? And I'm saying 40 is the high final cutoff. Okay? Then we go and solve. Then we make queries. Okay? And I'm saying, given a total, anything that begins with the, with the capital is a variable. Okay? So, we don't have to go and worry about variables versus non-variables, okay, by declaring them. We just say that is the case. And I'm saying a total, a regular pass total holds true, okay, if the following conditions hold true, if any of the following conditions holds true. So, the comma is an or actually. And it's saying... Um, sorry, is an and. I'm very sorry. Is and. Okay? It's saying it should be the case that I can assign a value to pass cutoff variable that makes pass of that value true. That means I can find a fact. I can fact, find a fact by assigning an appropriate value to pass, uh, to, to pass cutoff that makes it true. Okay? I could have had pass cutoff 60. I could have had pass cutoff 70. In which case, it will try both values to make it, one of them succeed. Okay, it's not like ML, which goes and says, I will just choose the most recent one. It says, you know, I will find a value, assign a value to this variable that makes this fact true. Okay, so let's go and find a value of, of that kind. That's one condition. Yeah. So if you say pass cut of zero and pass cut of sixty, okay, both, yeah. everybody passes, okay, because it goes and says I will try all values for this variable till I get something true. So it is not really looking up the value. It's not really going to address and finding the value. It's not going to a property list and finding the value. It's searching a database to make it something come true, okay. In this case, we have only one value. That's why what you said was entirely correct. That is just looking up the value. But it's basically saying, let me find a value that's assigned to pass cut of the variable 
to make the pass cut off that value hold true. That's one condition. The other thing is that given the total I had, it should be greater than or equal to pass cut off. And then find me a value of high cut final cutoff that makes. Um, so that's, no, sorry, that's, that's, that's all it is, right? That's all it is. And then high final pass says that, look, I really have Uh, did I get, did I type this wrong? Oh, sorry. High final pass is correct, right? So it's just, it's just, it's just longer, longer. And then the total has a semicolon rather than a comma. And it says, uh, pass total final is true. If either regular pass total is true or high final pass total final is true. So that's what it is. We basically come up with facts. Facts are put in the database. There are rules given. In the rules, we can we we, do, we try to figure out a rule that makes something come true. Okay, if something makes it so when it says false, it says as far as I know, it's false because no rule or fact together made it true. It could be because your rule and facts are are insufficient, or it could be that you know they're sufficient and the answer is false. So it tries to make things come true. And how it searches, it's up to it. Yeah. So in that first line, you're giving it to 60. Can I give it more? Can I give it 0 and 60? Yes, you can give 0 and 60 both. Would it be like a lit? Like how would you, how would you write that? You would say high final pass. So, so let me just show that to you. Okay. Let me just, next slide. Okay. So pass cut off. We have three kinds of entities. One of them is a fact which is like terminal data. Rules are non-terminals. Okay. And and is equal to comma or is equal to semicolon. And there are queries which return true or false. Okay. And variables begin with capitals. And we find rather than use values of variables. We just find some assignment to a variable that will make this query true. This, this rule. Yeah. So like, I don't know, this is Okay, so if I'm trying to understand your question right, you're saying that what if I put final greater than or equal to high final threshold before high final threshold? Is that what you're saying? Um, that I, I, are you trying to understand what it did or are you trying to give me an alternative? I'm just like, I like, uh, so the alternative is that this comes before this? Um, okay, so it's like back at the second one. Okay, this is much simpler, good. Yeah, you could just put, you can just say less than 60 and less than. And so we just add on. Like yeah, you just add on, you, 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 you add on, add on an and. That's the or. Which is what we're doing with past total final. <laughs> yes, yes, you can, you can have multiple ones. And that's kind of where I want to answer Robert's question too. Okay. So just look at this past total comma final. I've got done it as an as an a, a odd between two clauses. I can get two different productions. And it'll just search all possible values. That's an implicit or. Okay? This equivalent. Okay? Again, this is more of a teaser, okay? Uh, but it gives you an idea. Of, and, and like I said, you know, this the way uh, Nathan explained it first, 
is also a valid way to understand things because that's exactly what the interpreter is doing. Okay? When it has only a restricted set of things. That the left-hand side is like a function call. Those are like variable assignments. But they're really facts and we can do far more. And this problem is not doing justice to the language. Okay? It's better than hello world, but it's not as good as it could be. Nobody in the world ever does this problem using phone. Okay, they always use how to figure out if somebody's a grandfather or somebody else. That's a classic example. Okay? And they give different rules of figuring out whether you're a grandfather from the mother's side or the father's side. And, and so that's the general. Given a parent, given a parent relationship, okay, parent facts, it figures out whether you're a grandfather or not. That's the classic example. We'll do that later. I'm just trying to show the equivalence between life. Other questions? So if we wanted pass cut off to be defined for whatever reason as 60 and 80, we wouldn't have like a list within those parentheses, we just define it twice. Define it twice. Okay. So this is very important. Think about this versus overloading. If you think of this as function calls, then basically I have two definitions of the fun same function call, right? But in overloading, the signatures better be different. Otherwise, we don't know at compile time which one to call. Here, the signatures can be the same, and at runtime, we just try all. In fact, I've seen language designs where they go and say, how do we solve the multiple inheritance problem where you can create a, get a two-string from one class, another two-string from the other class? We just call all of them and somehow combine them together. Okay? So here it's saying, I'll keep calling till I find the correct answer. And it might be that the correct whether you get the correct answer now or later depends on in which order you tried it, right? You might, just, you might just try the wrong thing each time and then come to the really correct one at the very end. So there are ways in Prolog to tell it, hey, go this route. Okay? As an optimization thing. Not as a correctness thing, as an optimization thing, uh, go this route. Or don't backtrack. So what it really does is it, it, it goes this direction when it fails, it backtracks and tries to assign a different value and then forward, goes forward again. Okay, it's a very powerful system. And if you do the power, you do the final assignment, you'll write a prologue interpreter in ML. Okay, and you'll really see what that is. This is a unification algorithm that it uses. Okay? So order of rules and operands of and or should only affect performance and not correctness. And in procedural languages, a single alternative for a function call is chosen at compile time based on its signature. Okay. In Prolog, all are definitional rule and they are tried until one can be derived from the facts and rules. Okay. So, uh, it should at, at, at this point either be interesting or, or challenging. If it's neither, then you guys are going to be bored, bored with stuff. So you still have time, you know, this drop date is not over. Uh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully you find one of these two true. One of the reasons I'm going through this whole overview is to give you a preview of what you can expect. Okay? So that you can backtrack and choose another way to graduate. Right? Okay. Questions? Yeah. Matt. You should be. This is the... <laughs> It doesn't make sense here. It doesn't make sense here. But when you're trying to establish whether somebody's a grandfather or somebody else, you might first try to establish that from the father's side and then or establish that from the mother's side. So you, you, you just, you know, there's more than one way to do so. But you see with pass total comma final, there's more than one way to pass, right? So there's more than one rule for that at least. And it'll you will try one or the other in some order. Perhaps top to bottom. Or maybe not. Right? So there you see, 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 you see two different rules. Right. Yeah. But you can have a fact that says, you know, all-time great in tennis, Nadal. You can have another fact, all-time great in tennis, Federer. And it will try to find whether you've beaten somebody who's all-time great in tennis. Using one of the two things. Okay? So we don't know who's going to be the goat, as they put it, uh, greatest of all time. So you can have more than one value. Okay? I'm watching US Open in the night, so my head is full of this stuff. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. You know, I have found limitations of Google Drive that are unintuitive. Okay, I've actually worked in access control and I thought something would work. I can either give read access to everybody or I can give full access to UNC people. I can't do both. I tried to do that first. I gave full access to uh, UNC students. And then I got messages from people saying, hey, you know, I'm using my Google account and please give me access. So I said, OK, you know, I, I can understand you guys not wanting to log in with your uh, thing. So I give all that. But I don't want to give anyone in the world access to delete my files. Okay, I trust I trust people here, but not anybody. So I just this is just a limitation of, of, of Google from what I can figure out. If you guys figure out a way to do it. But it was totally unintuitive to me because it's totally unreasonable in my mind. You want to add some things? Just, just, uh, just, just mail them to me. I'll add, add them. I can't find a way. If you can, if you can find a way from Google Shared Drives, let me know. Okay. But you can certainly edit the files. You can edit the files. I've given you comment access. In commenting mode, you can edit. So the folder you don't have access, the documents you have access, all you guys are already changing my, uh, which is good, uh, my course syllabus, you have the same access to the, just try it again. If that, the folder you can't delete, you can't delete the file, but you can add to it. You can add things to the file in the comment mode. That will be a suggestion that I can accept. Okay.